controversia esta tarde. Building a New Digital Banking and Financial Services. Es un gusto y un honor contar con la presencia de Hugo Nájera, Director General Client Solutions de BBV, Carlos López Moctezuma, CEO de Bancomer, José Antonio Murillo, Chief Analytics Officer de Grupo Financiero Bancomer, y como anfitrión, Brett King, célebre autor de Banking for Points Here. We welcome Carlos Hugo José Antonio Jorge to the Digital Banking and Financial Technology Forum 2021. Welcome to this uh, phenomenal panel with a uh, A-team a, a lineup, I can say. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to have such distinguished panelists join us here. Uh, I have my good friend Paolo Cerrone, uh, who's, who's here as well. We've worked together for many years. Paolo, how is the new book going? Oh, extremely well, thanks. Actually, we delivered nine hour classes at the Rismatris conference uh, uh, these days uh, about uh, the book content. It has been uh, surpassing every expectation, went out of stock in many countries, is already available through Amazon, delivered in Europe, and soon Amazon is delivering also in the US. So it's just exciting to be here uh, exactly those weeks when the book has been going out, and it talks about banking transformation. Absolutely. Well, let me uh, first ask Hugo uh, if I could, you know, maybe get you to explain a little bit about the culture at BBVA in respect to this mission of technology, because, you know, BBVA was one of the first uh, major banks in the world that came out and said, we're going to be a technology company in the future. Um, and this at the time was, it was quite controversial. Now, uh, not as much, but, you know, how, how does the culture at BBVA support this mission? I think that it has been a, a long trip because we, when we start to talk about uh, that we were a tech company, it was hard to believe. But it's, it's true, no? The, the banking system is just data, transforming the data between people. Uh, but I think that the, 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 the real key was when the regulation allowed us to, to give the first step. And the first step was the digital account. The digital account for the banking system is like the digital camera camera for Kodak. No, it's the yeah. is the very disruptive element in the in the because transform a lot uh, your distribution model. No, the way that you have the relationship with the with the customer with the final consumer. Then uh, to re to real create something around this this key that it, it was the, the digital account, was necessary um, first to admit that we don't have in our the DNA the main elements that we need to, 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 to jump to the digital world. We don't have any designers. Right. Uh, data data scientists. Set, yeah. It's the different skills. We need to attract, to acquire, because we cannot develop that skills inside. And the first step was bring that talent and that skills to the company. The second one thing that we did, it was to move uh, from the from the waterfall projects to Agile. No, It was a very big shock because moving to Agile, it means that the, the older people in the company is start to to, to be some 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 they had losses no they yeah. lost all the things that they, they that they were fighting struggling to reach something better for his for their lives <clears throat> and agile keep it out no it's yeah. it's uh, it's amazing hard for them uh, and uh, I think that uh, we are living now a very positive uh, culture where where we privilege the the, the customer uh, the customer journey through design uh, in a very intelligent way, trying to use the data in the best way that we can, and the approach is mobile first. Mobile first yeah. is the key to to stop investing in the old-fashioned relationship in the branches and trying to build something intelligent in the mobile device. Awesome. 
How how quickly can you get um, you know stuff done there in terms of um, new innovative uh, apps was, or experiences? It was more than five years. In the last five years was a very good trip for us. Yeah. Carlos, um, at Bank Copa, um, you know, you, uh, as a leader in this space, you know, how, how do you set the tone from a leadership perspective for your team, giving them permission to do things that, you know, just a few years ago would have been considered unconventional or risky, maybe? Yeah, sure. Uh I think um, we, we have some competitive advantages that uh, are very important, uh, basically in the mass market. No, we we, we serve people that the, the traditional banks do not uh, serve, and and we had a very successful uh, brick and mortar model uh, until until very few years ago, where uh, we, we really serve the, the not only the base of the pyramid, but, but the mass market, 70% of the of the population that is in that market through through uh, uh, financing them and providing them uh, accounts and providing them a, a, a close uh, place where they can put their money. You know? uh, geographically, we are in a different places than the traditional banks then that's that's how how the group built uh, the, the the business model and uh, but now that's that's not enough um, in in the in, in recent years uh, I, I think um, digitalization has taken a, a very important part of our strategy and, and why is that because uh, in the in in these segments that we share they are also adopting the new technologies that the other uh, segments uh, have uh, uh, acquired in, 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 in the last years. Then there is not a topic more of, of financial inclusion or, 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 or having um, a different technology to serve those segments. Now uh, it's the same, exactly the same technology that we need to serve them. And and we are uh, we are exactly in that trip that that maybe Hugo was describing that we started some some years ago. We are now uh, not only uh, digitalizing all our uh, current uh, uh, products and, and services, but also creating native digital products for 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 this segment that we are we are serving. So, a uh, sort of non-conventional approach to a segment that you really are learning a lot about, right? Yeah, just uh, adding one thing. Uh, the other competitive advantage is that that we we uh, it's our risk models, our credit models, because we are serving half of our clients are in the informal sector, and we lend them money in an unconventional way, <laughs> offering them different credit and loans through through different risk models. And, 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 and that is also an, an advantage that we are now taking to the digital world also. Awesome. Paolo, um, can you comment on like creating more open organizations and sort of the the evolving operating model, um, particularly, you know, as it speaks to digital transformation? Absolutely. Unlocking uh, business value from digital transformation is not just about technology. It's also about culture and organization in the foreword of the new book, Banks and Fintech on Platform Economies. Yourself, Brett, uh, were, were was mentioning about the open organization of companies like uh, Alibaba. So how you transform the way you work being very important. Now, we just released uh, as uh, the Institute of Business Value in IBV um, a report titled Unlock the Business Value of Public Cloud. That basically wants to answer this question. Suppose that you invest uh, on cloud technology being the foundation of technology how much value can you unlock? And we at face uh, we, we shift the question this way. Suppose you have $100 on the table and you're the CEO of a bank and now you invest in cloud. How much money in terms of extra revenues can you grab? Now, if you only do that in isolation, you can only get $5 out of the table and $95 remain on the table. So in order to get all the other money on the table, you need to do a few things. Of course, you need to plug in data and AI, so automation that is uh, like an extra 15%. Of course, you need to plug in operational enablers, in particular cybersecurity, that might add another 25%. But 50% of the money remains on the table. 
Now, to unlock that value, you need to change the culture and embrace right. the organization. That means, uh, uh, in essence, uh, um, opening the organization to work with ecosystems, uh, breaking the barriers inside uh, your shop. And why this is so? To explain that to you, I want to make an example. Like we compared two industries, uh, automotive uh, and banking. Now, in banking, uh, you can uh, multiply times 20 the impact of revenues because you go from 5% to 100% when you plug a cloud investment inside the enterprise transformation. And in automotive is much less, it's like times four, because cloud in itself already generates value. Now, it's not a dollar representation, right? It's a percentage discussion on where the money and the value comes from. Now, why this is so? Because if you think about it, automotive and banking are fairly linear industries today. And when an automotive company decides to build a product, they work with the best manufacturers. So basically they find the one that builds the best steering wheel, the best ladder for the back seat, the best Navi system. And then they package everything in a way that when the client goes in front of the car dealer, the client can hyper-personalize is uh, purchased according to the level of wealth. So you can basically get out with the car you want. But what happens in the end is that you don't have a relationship with every manufacturer of uh, the car product. You price uh, an all-in relationship, you buy the car, one price, and you get everything that you need. And maybe you add on top some leasing and other stuff. But think about the same in banking. Now, in automotive, you use the car to go from A to B. But in banking, you need to go from A to B in life. And to do that, you need multiple products. You may need a saving account. You may need a payment mechanism, a credit card or something else. You may need a mortgage or a loan. You may need to take care of retirement. You may need to think about uh, donations uh, and other stuff. And what happens is that the bank does not see you in completion, basically tries to sell to you through different business units each individual product and every business unit in the banking group have a different incentives. Really but that does not allow you to create an all-in solution that the client basically prices in front of the bank. The client is forced to buy this product at this joint point in time. So even though you build with and negotiate with each separate single view, you cannot create a single solution. So that's the reason why for banks, the pain to create a open organization is higher because of cultural and organizational reasons, but the benefits are much higher. So I do believe that it is starting from the open organization that then unlocks the capabilities of leveraging data and AI across uh, the banking group and therefore creates uh, basically new revenues that leverage exponential technologies. Jose, um, you know, We've se thank you, Paolo. Uh, we we've seen Jose um, the explosion of fintechs around the world this year. There was a lot of debate around whether these fintechs would survive their first real crisis. I think that debate is over. We had our first and you know our, our, the first quarter and the second quarter were both the largest uh, funding rounds on record for uh, any single quarter in the last uh, thirteen years. Um, and, you know, we are seeing fintechs take market share. Um, you know, we see Nubank doing incredible things in LATAM, 40 million customers that they've grown, you know, overnight almost. We bank in Shenzhen, 200 million customers. So th there's a big differentiation emerging around fintechs in their capability to acquire customers digitally. A lot of the banks are having to shift from this physical presence focus to digital, and it takes a whole set of different competencies. So you know, talk to us about Rappi Pay in terms of what you guys went through uh, as a learning curve in respect to digital acquisition so that you could become a, a unicorn. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, Brett. And uh, let me uh, tell you, uh, so far we've been uh, 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 taking the market at a fast pace in some sense, because we started uh, in Mexico, where I'm leading the, the effort, but uh, it has expanded very quickly to, to do also the same thing at Colombia, uh, Peru, Brazil, and we are about to launch uh, Chile. And I guess uh, the, what, ha what uh, we are seeing is that there's a big opportunity to, uh, to serve a new generation of, uh, of customers that are more uh, in their DNA, they are more, much more digital. They, uh, 
like to have a simple uh, interaction with uh, with their bank on uh, uh, through the through their mobile, and uh, and I guess uh, new bank has been a, a truly success story, and if you look at the efforts from uh, uh, what will be Rapid Bank, it's it's also surprising because we've uh, in Mexico we are now selling credit cards at a pace of uh, large you know, well established banks and I guess what uh, gives you an advantage and going back to Carlos point on on what are the the main advantages that you have to to serve these uh, uh, new generation of customers uh, in his case he talked about uh, risk models and that's certainly a, a you know the one of your um, basic points. And I guess what Rappi has also is that it's, uh, you live within an, uh, the Rappi ecosystem. And uh, so basically you are living within a super app in which you have a little bit more of knowledge about your customers on what are their preferences and uh, what the, uh, what, uh, it's their transactional patterns and uh, so a, da can, uh, a data advantage right you have a data advantage and i guess at the end of the day what you want is to understand much better the customer and uh, all of us we're in the business of expanding the possibilities frontiers of our customers and uh, and for me that's all about it to to really uh, help our customers to, uh, to expand their, their possibilities. So um, maybe if Hugo, if I come back to you on this one, um, you know, what Jose is talking about in the tech giants, we see them, you know, increasingly trying to embed wallets and payments experiences and so forth, you know, experimenting with this, you know, Google uh, experimented partnering with banks and issuing debit cards in the United States, and then they pull back from that. You've got Apple partnering with Goldman Sachs and Marcus. You've got Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay partnering with other wallets uh, around the world and, um, you know, banks as well. So there's a lot of cooperation here and one of the things that um, Jose points out is that the you know different type of data is a lot more critical when you have a mobile first position because you're looking for those triggers or behaviors that may be sort of macro you know behavioral data that banks don't necessarily capture so what what um, what sort of partnerships have you guys explored to try and expand on the data uh, possibilities and the data you use we are trying to do a lot of things in that space because you you have a lot of reason. Uh, we have just transactional data, probably a strong KYC, stronger than the, this uh, new uh, new kind of competitors because they are not really a banks. Uh, and we're trying to to be very open uh, in, in in a very collaborative way. No, we are in this position to give. Our, our routines through APIs and the data every time that the, the customer allow it and then give their, their permission to do it. But at the same time, we need to, to, to bring for us the data of the people that the, the, that uh, transactional or that uh, kind of data that they, um, 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 that they have in, in, other, in other environments. The, 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 the problem is here is that the regulation is not um, enough advanced no to, to allow us to do that no the, the fintech law is, is is going in the slowest way that that we expected before but they, they are trying to do the, their best no the regulators are trying to do their best but we are not in the point that we can get that data that that's why we are trying to find partnerships uh, that allow us to produce new products and services. No, It's more than trying just to, 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 to find a new channel for distribution. It's more than just to want just the desire to sell more credit cards. It's trying to, to bring alive new kind of pro products that don't ex doesn't exist if we don't if we are not together working together. No? 
And that's our position. Uh, we have two or three uh, that uh, this, this kind of partnerships. For example, we are working with Uber. Uber, Uber a driver in Uber can get a BBBA account, not in the branch, not in the BBBA app, but in the uh, Uber app. In the so, Uber app, yeah. Exactly, and, and that's the, the first step to, to create a relationship that allows us to give them special products and services for them. Designed this, around this, exactly, it's designed around work and, this yeah. journey. No, that's 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 the movement that we want to do. I think that's that's great, Paolo. Um, you know, you you see a lot of different banks around the world. Which of those banks are really have really got sort of the partnership model? Um, you know, where that's evolved, where, because, you know, I, I mean, I run a fintech and I try and partner with banks all around the world. And most of the time, especially with procurement department involved, it, it's very tricky. It's very complex. It takes a long time. So where are you seeing banks that are really switching it up in terms of this you know, platform model and the partnership model where they're moving a lot quicker to form these uh, critical data partnerships and distribution? partnerships? Well, uh, Brett, I have to say that when I uh, funded my startup in 2008, uh, I built the pipeline before building the product because I thought it would be very difficult for a small company to go through procurement in banking. So that's why I started with an industrial partner that was a German bank and so on and so forth. Now, the difference uh, is seen uh, among those banks that have uh, a clearer understanding on how they can succeed on the platform economies because they have a strategy that looks ahead on the full transformation on the relationship with clients. And because they are thinking with an all-in type of a solution approach, how to rebundle financial services, instead of trying to optimize value species of their distribution channel products, those banks instead, they still think very linear. So I might scout this FinTech or that FinTech to improve that piece of the process. We'll have a hard time to break through because they don't know how to generate real value out of those relationships. Relationships. And I can explain to you with this example that comes from, uh, from my personal life. Because in the 1990s, I helped my brother in Italy to build the Amazon of Italy. Now, that is very ambitious, but really we had a very slick internet design. We thought that we could sell the best of Italy, fashion, food, furniture and travel. Why people wouldn't come to our website and buy it? Nobody bought it. Okay, so it was not successful. It was a, a big effort, a good entrepreneurial exercise, but we didn't make it happen. And, and a few years after, I learned from Jeff Bezos uh, the main mistake that we made among the many others. He was interviewed on 60 Minutes, uh, and the journalist asked him, what's Amazon? Now, Brett, you are my agent, so you remember that uh, when Amazon started, it was only selling books and then started adding other services. So Jeff Bezos with his spirited eyes responded, Amazon is not a distribution channel of books on the internet. And the journalist was puzzled. Now ask yourself, is a bank a distribution channel of products on digital? So he basically explained that this way. He said, the publishers are sending me letters complaining that I don't understand marketing because I allow people to write positive and negative reviews uh, on uh, Amazon, but I should only publish positive reviews so that uh, they can sell more. And he said that they are wrong because they are not my client. I'm not the distribution channel of books right. on the internet. He said, my role is to advise the client uh, to basically get the best book they want to buy, knowing that uh, as they are distant, they may not be able to make the decision. And therefore, that's, that's what why gives them confidence in the platform. Right? Exactly. Right. So now, the problem here is that many people, especially when it comes to consuming more complex financial services, products, which are investment products or insurance products, are not capable of self-directing themselves. You can think about uh, uh, life insurance. If they have to sell to you life insurance, they need to tell you you're going to die. You may not want to have that conversation with a chatbot, right? But you prefer to have it with a person. So now the key message here is that um, you should stop thinking uh, digital as uh, a marketplace where you position your digital products and maybe use uh, techniques uh, in order to basically move around with the client. Even Jeff Bezos said that after I build confidence, I use analytics uh, basically to engage the client. So first and foremost, we need to learn that uh, 
banks should not just sell products with margins that are going down. They need to find a way to bundle on platform economies these elements by creating new bundle solutions where they use artificial intelligence and data to enable the client to understand more than optimizing the marketing. That comes only second. So I do believe that those banks, especially in Asia, that understood at this point are those that are capable of integrating fintech capabilities much faster because they have a framework to operate on digital. The other banks might try to do, but then they might miss the point because they won't be able to create, unlock new value from the ecosystem, which is hidden inside the different type of perspective. But what, now, what here? Tell us, jump in. Uh, uh, I think one th one thing that uh, a financial provider should avoid is to become a commodity, and and that's what happened when you you see all these uh, ecosystems only as a distribution channel for you. You you need to to go further and you need to think what what is the value added that I am providing to the client. Because when you are interacting or, or with big techs or, or with fintechs, uh, with the big ones, you, you are running that risk of becoming a commodity in their, their environment, in their ecosystem. And, 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 and that's where, where you should put your effort, thinking what are the main um, uh, value added that, 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 that you can really provide to the client for not becoming an, a commodity. Because commodity... It's, 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 it's not a huge margin business. No? It's a very small margin business. When, when you are really being relevant for the client, you are, you are changing the game and you, con you will continue being there because you are providing them something uh, differential for, for, for them. Yes. Uh, was Carlos, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with that, but you know, I think there is pressure up in, in terms of operational costs on banks everywhere right now because of digital transformation as well. Um, so there is a point where you still have to really get a lot more efficient to be able to deliver services to customers. And part of that may be distribution um, partners and things like that. But operational costs are clearly under, under increasing pressure and the margins are thinning, right? Yeah, but let, let me let me talk about um, something that that is specific of the Latin American and, and especially in in the Mexican market. Um, uh, somebody thinks that if you digitalize all your products and 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 you eliminate all the branches, um, you are you are being more efficient and and you are really uh, having um, uh, cost efficient. But but in this economy, that's not true. I, I think we 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 are really a, a heavy cash economy, and, and 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 not only that that we are like really fighting against cash. Cash is growing in this economy because informal sector is growing and and has has grown a lot in the in the last couple of years and more with the with 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 COVID nineteen. Then. Um, here in these countries, you need a, a model where, where you can balance your cash in, cash out, cash out networks with your digital uh, banking model. If not, uh, it will be very difficult. For, for example, for for these uh, newcomers, for the new banks of of this world, to really make a, a profitable business, because you don't have any any cash in cash out network then um, of course you need to digitalize and, and be more cost efficient but there are some specific things in in markets like mexico that are are, are that, that you you need to balance your your model I, i'm a little concerned carlos that we're sort of going back to some of the older paradigms of, of thinking here but i give i give you that you're right there is you know uh, mexico in particular with cash latam uh, with with cash usage but you know we saw china which was dominantly cash you know in 2014 china with 98 percent of retail transactions were cash and it's going to be below 30 percent this year right yes, and but, but, but and, the, 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 in China, you have an authority that allow all the people have an account. It's the same. The, the same happened in Spain. Right. In Spain, because you cannot have services if you don't have an account. Right. But while the the, the, the Mexican government don't don't move in that way, that they don't want to move in that way, the cash will be strong in 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 this country, and that's why. I, I'm totally agree with you that the future is is in another side, 
But at the but time, the, the reality, the reality in in Latin America countries, it's it's like Carlos is saying. Yeah, I I I, I don't disagree. I just think it it has the potential to change quite quickly, but it's dependent on digital inclusion, which is the problem we must solve, right? Um, Jose, can we talk a little bit about um, financial inclusion in the Latin American countries? Um, because, you know, that's one of New Bank's claims to fame, that they, you know, a lot of their customers, it's their first bank account. Um, for for Rappi, um, you know, are you finding very similar that, um, you know, they, they come to the super app and and then they start using the sort of banking functions more as a, a, a means of enabling, um, you know, commerce and, and purchasing or, you know, how is financial inclusion sort of playing into your model? I guess financial inclusion is the, the holy grail as, after which many of us we are uh, seeking. However, uh, the, first, uh, the first adopters of the Rappi card are more kind of like a more upscale market, if you want to call it that way, in the sense that uh, customers that are, are using delivery services tend to have a higher income than uh, the non-delivery uh, service uh, users. Also, what, what we're having as early adopters are more kind of like young people who are uh, perhaps new to credit, or in some cases uh, new to banks, but they tend to have uh, a higher income. I guess the big promise is, uh, is uh, to be able to, uh, once you have this perhaps uh, founding customer base, is how do you move away from the RAPI ecosystem so that, uh, and, and, and you have probably the next step would be you have two options where you, you can go. Either you go after the premium uh, market and uh, you know, your younger, younger affluent uh, customers, or you move towards uh, financial, you know, financial uh, inclusion and people that are underbanked or, or non-banked yet. And I guess uh, you might say you can go for, you know, why don't you go for, for everything? And, you know, that might end up being the case, but uh, but uh, so it depends on funding. Has... Yeah, let, 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 let me complement that. I, I totally agree, and I, I think um, I, I, I think that I, I don't have the numbers uh, have it, but uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, this this is a model that is starting uh, cannibalizing uh, the same clients uh, that that the traditional banks uh, have, and that's normal, and, and and that's the way I would do so also. Why? B because I don't have uh, a way to 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 really make pro profit from from lower segments if I don't have again the the risk models and and, and the risk appetite for going to uh, to that market. That it, it's it's different and it's very complex. And I think uh, in terms of financial inclusion, um, traditional banks have been very good uh, bankarizing people with accounts. And I think BBA it's a great example. They 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 um, uh, also distribute a lot of the government subsidies and and different programs. And and then they have a lot of of payroll accounts. But when you talk about the, the financing. Uh, that that's where uh, all these new models and, and also the traditional banking models they do not uh, reach the the, the 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 financial inclusion uh, segment of, of the population. Well, yeah, yes and no. I mean, we bank in Shenzhen, like I think. 60% uh, of their customer base is newly included and they're getting credit offers at, in the range of like $50, right, US. Um, so I think there are some models out there um, in, in support of this. But, you know, I, I get that the financial inclusion I I issues is a tough one. But, um, Paolo, um, where do you sit on the commoditization angle? Because, you know, the, 
distribution um, by virtue of the fact that banking is now going to be embedded in our smartphones, it's going to be embedded in smart glasses in a few years, smart speakers in our car. Increasingly, you know, we are at the mercy of these super apps, these app stores, these technology operating systems in terms of, you know, the, the placement of our app or um, that it, it's harder to to build brands in this this sort of environment, right? Yes. So I heard uh, what Jose was saying about commoditization. I would say that uh, banking products are commoditizing anyway as interest rates uh, get lower and lower and competition and transparency increases in the investment management processes. So the question is really how to build a new value and differentiate on that value, whether you operate on digital or not. Now, this is exactly what I brought inside this new book uh, by building the Bank Innovation Quadrant, which is uh, a way to explain how to intensify the information quotient, basically operating with open ecosystems and cloud, and intensify the communication quotient, so enhancing the relationships uh, with the trusted data and AI in order to reach two value spaces which are palatable for banks uh, that are named contextual banking and conscious banking. Where did uh, was first conceived? A few years ago, like three years ago, the board of Shanghai Pudong Development Bank asked me these questions after the presentation. They said, how can we compete with Alibaba and WeChat, knowing that they are so dominant on the retail right. market? that they can transform and commoditize any product that they basically we can put out there so we can differentiate. So we and, 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 and arguably, to Carlos's point, they're better at risk management um, because okay. of their data models. Yes, if you see, for example, uh, just for the um, for risk of fraud, for example, right on the payment mechanism on uh, online financial, that's a surprisingly resilient and, and, and efficient compared to those of credit cards in the Western world. But basically, the point here was that uh, we needed to identify how to help a bank in a world where the power of the big tech was already so dominant to differentiate on value while still going through an embeddedness process of contextualizing at the banking services and solutions. And, uh, and therefore, uh, we conceived this one that became the Banking Innovation Quadrant in a very early version that was published under the name of Panoramic Banking that I co-presented at the End Financial Conference uh, in September 2019 together with SPDB. Now, what is the issue? The issue is that on the one side, uh, Brett, you teach me here, it is the opportunity to remove frictions from an ecosystem that typically is not a banking ecosystem that makes banks contextualized. Now, the point here, however, is to be ahead of the process. So I've been working as a BM with clients that launched their uh, contextualized banking experience. You can think about SBI Yono. SBI is the largest uh, uh, bank uh, in India, the State Bank of India, 350 million customers, more than the US population. And Yono, you only need one, which is a marketplace to buy products, uh, is now valued something like 62 billion, more than the bank itself. So they created the contextualization into a marketplace in order to plug a digital wallet in the very middle and then start the positioning investment products and insurance solutions on a mechanism that was engaging client on a different ecosystem that was not a banking ecosystem. So you have a way to make sure that while a lot of things commoditize, you generate new value by participating on owning these solutions. So competing head to head with the fintech or with the big tech players. All right, but that's, that's, a, that's a big ask. Paolo, because, you know, um, yeah, I'm going to make a statement here and I want your reaction, you know, particularly Carlos, Hugo, um, you know, Jose, he's going to be in the fintech camp with me, I think. But um, all of the fastest growing financial institutions in the world now are fintechs, right? So at some point, that's a market share issue. So I know what we're saying about commoditization and, and really serving your segments and things like that, but isn't the reality that just purely digital acquisition and the ability to acquire customers at scale is reshaping the market? Yeah, what I think so. Think? I think so. It's, it's, it's yes. I think that the, the new entrants in Mexico, uh, Rappi and New Bank, for sure in a very short time will take a five, Six percent of the of the total market share in the in the credit card, with with without no doubt, uh, not 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 again us, 
probably with others, but but for sure they they will take Hopefully. more than five percent. Yes, and it's a it's a, it's a good thing because they are they are competing in a very fair way because they are not fintechs. They are banks. They they welcome to the families. They are regulated. They they need to to cover all the things that we need. Of just course. just a different thing that is. Uh, they are nat natives in the in the tech side, and we are immigrants. And for us, right. it's more difficult to get the, the goals to reach the goals that they that they have. Then they don't have they, legacy tech. They exactly, don't have legacy policy exactly, and process. Exactly. None of those things that exactly. you guys have to. Circulate. Then I, I think that is is uh, is welcome. Is is some is new competitors that make us oblige us to be better. And to serve in a better way to the, the customer, and perhaps, and for sure, the interest rates will drop, and the and the and the fees and all that things, and it's good for the country, no? But uh, even when we, when we are doing that, and I am saying that, more than a half of the population will not get in inside of them uh, of of these uh, new propositions, because you know, when when you are a bank. You have the money that people have, and, they, and 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 you lend that money to the people that need that need it, and and uh, and to do that, uh, you need to to have an account and put the cash that the people receive in in cash inside the account, and the the the, the big problem that we have in Mexico and Latin America is we are not answering the the right question that is why. Right. A person should have an account. That's the, that's the real question that we are not answering. And we and I I I I, I have the, the the idea that or the or the the perception that the if we attack re really with with the different data models, the lending side of the banking, we are solving part of the of the of the equation. Yeah. But we are not yet. In that point, so guys, you know, we we only have about five minutes left before we open it up to uh, Q and A. So what I'd like you to do is this: is let's just go around the table. Um, I'd like you each. Uh, I'll start with Jose. You know, if it, what advice would you give to a CEO or an executive in a bank today in terms of how they should prioritize, uh, you know, their their digitization efforts, Jose? Going back to Ugo's point. I used to be an immigrant in this space, and now I become a native. And there's uh, one dimension that, that needs to be always in the mind of uh, traditional financial players, and it's speed. Because when you're an immigrant, as Ugo was saying, things move at a slow pace, always. There are people that have done it fantastically well, and they moved at a fast pace, but that's relative to what uh, fintechs are doing. And it's uh, my best uh, recommendation is to uh, read a book called uh, Lead Scaling. And uh, that might give an idea of how quickly things will be moving. And it's not a 10 year span that things are going to be changed. Absolutely it's not. It's getting at an exponential speed. Rapido, yes. Uh, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the biggest challenge for, for these immigrants uh, to, 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 to the digital world is, is how to manage uh, transformation and, and, and technology transformation also. How, how could you uh, move to a more modern state-of-the-art new uh, te technology stack at the same time that you don't stop delivering products to the market and how 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 you um, build a strategy for really uh, moving in two speeds continue delivering in the old systems and at the same time becoming a, a digital player uh, that's uh, that's yeah. a very important part I, I describe this as being schizophrenic Banking schizophrenia, yeah. digital and yeah, old world. Um, Hugo, um, and then we'll finish with Paolo. What, what, me, what advice would you give to a, a, a leader in a, three, a business? Three different things. Just the first one is invest all, all you can in artificial intelligence. 
to reduce your cost of, for service. No, the, the, the servicing cost of the banks are huge. Then artificial intelligence to, to serve the people. Second one is invest a lot of money in new risk models with open data, not with the data that you have and the bureau. Because the key to solve the rest of the equation in the in the in this ocean, blue ocean of bankarization is about that that we are can answer that question. And the third one is use the cloud all you can. Unfortunately, Absolutely. the authority not, don't allow us to, to, to do it in the way that we want, but we, we need to convince the, 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 the big companies to bring the servers to Mexico <laughs> in order to can use it uh, in a fastest way as possible. But that, that is the three recommendations. Artificial intelligence, data for risk, new new business models, and cloud. Interesting, Paolo. What 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 advice are you, okay. are you giving CEOs of banks? A, a, apart from competing with those F for literature and inviting them to buy many book banks and fintech on platform economies, I want to tell you what we revealed with the latest CEO study of IBM, the City for Business Value, at the beginning of this year. That's another good one. Now, um, this year study interviewed uh, 3,000 CEOs worldwide, and we asked them what is essential in the post-pandemic world. And the banking and financial market CEO said the three things. One concern globally, one priority, one enabler. The concern and the uncertainty in macroeconomic conditions and in markets as competition is increasing. So they know that that will remain is a fact that they need to live with. So now the priority for them to accelerate in a world that becomes more uncertain where we need to gain speed, but they also need to have trust is to build a banking as a service and a banking as a platform infrastructure that enables them to interact with the capabilities of the ecosystem of partners because they will not be able to build internally. So they need to have a secure framework, a consistent framework to onboard those capabilities. And the third is a business enabler. Cybersecurity is not anymore a thing for the gigs. If you don't have a good cybersecurity by shifting to the left the security in every piece of your development process and making sure that you have zero trust, you will not be able to get the trust that enables you to get the speed that Jose was talking about in the continuous reinvention process process of banking transformation. So these are the three elements that we've been suggesting the CEOs, especially those that don't know where to start, start from this at least. Fair enough. Um, does anyone want to have a shot at this one? Who's the best bank in the world at, at digital, the, a traditional bank? Or who's the best in LATAM? We could say BCDA. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's jump into question and answer with the audience, uh, if we can now. So, um, for those of you that have some uh, questions for the panelists, uh, please uh, let us know. We can either um, bring you into the conversation or let us know in the chat. Um, Thank you, Carlos, Thank Hugo, you. Jose Antonio, Paolo, and Brian for Paolo such an break. insightful for and mind-opening discussion. One. We have indeed some questions, and some questions that probably are gonna, <clears throat> are aimed at uh, getting some healthy uh, confrontation of ideas. Uh, Technology-based user experience is limitless in principle, because technology allows us to do almost anything that we can do. And then we have the partnership issue, that Brett mentioned. Uh, for example, traditional banks working together with fintechs. So it's not only a technology issue, it's a cultural issue from the side of the banks, I mean. Is the culture of traditional banks a culture that helps foster, incorporate, bring on board innovation from wherever it comes in financial services or is it rather a silo mentality that prevents this from happening? What is your take on this? Um, let, let me take uh, this Please, one. Carlos. I, I, I think culture is changing in general in, 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 in traditional banks. I, I think, uh, I don't see many banks that 
have this old school uh, mentality of not being digital, of not uh, adopting um, uh, innovation. I, I think that's that's not true. Everybody wants to adopt innovation. Even Kodak wanted to adopt innovation. It's, it's not that they didn't want to adopt innovation. It's, it's, it's something that, that you have a business running and, and sometimes uh, the speed in, in which you adopt that uh, innovation and, and that culture is not enough for the market. I think uh, here um, the, the traditional banks that will survive are, are those ones that react faster to, to those innovations and to those partnerships. Well, can I add to this one? I think that the banks are missing one key point when it comes to culture and innovation. They are not thinking platforms. Back in the 1970s, uh, when Bill Gates uh, and Steve Jobs started competing, it happened that Steve Jobs had a much better product because the Macintosh was very good, but it was closed. It was not uh, thinking platforms. Instead, Bill Gates worked with IBM, created the um, MS-DOS uh, for uh, the IBM compatible computer and started allowing the world of developers to develop on the platform and became a basic Microsoft. Now, Steve Jobs learned that lesson. And then when he launched uh, the Apple thereafter and created the, the Apple Store, he opened it up and he operated it as a platform and he became the first company to hit the $1 trillion on Wall Street. Now, banks, yes, they look at digital, but if they're not thinking platform and they keep on thinking linear like a distribution of products, they will not make it happen. And so there is more that has to happen because all of the competitors that come from the non-banking in China, outside China, also the payment providers that want to build super apps are going to think platforms and platforms dominate the internet and digital economies. Okay. Let's go with the next question. Okay. Um, a renowned expert in future trends in banking told me in one event in Rismatics two years ago that the physical branch model of banking was basically obsolete, giving way to the cloud-based. He was a banking. smart guy. But if I drive to <laughs> Mexico City Street or Guadalajara or Monterrey or any major Latin American city, I see the streets full of branches. So I want to ask you, three bankers and a consultant, and a banker, sorry, two bankers, a banker, Tron FinTech, and a consultant. Is the branch going to be relevant for the Mexican and the Latin American banking system in 10 years, in 15 years? For how long the physical branch is going to be the center of the financial I think, I think that, let me, let me tell you something. I, I think that we tend to subestimate the power of the branch, not for the banking, eh? not for banking. The branch could be many things. Mm -hmm. Then now the, 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 the branch serve because you have a lot of cash, as Carlos said before. Um, if you want to put your money in, you need to go a branch or a correspondent bank. If you want to take your money in cash because they don't, they, in some merchant don't send you a credit or the debit card, you need to uh, an, an ATM. The ATMs in Mexico, at least, when you try to put ATMs alone, stand alone, not in the branches, they are one. They, they are vandalized. Yeah. Uh, you need to have it in the branches. Then the branches, as 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 the informal economy, still there, as the, as the many things uh, like like happening in Mexico, the branches will be important. But the most important thing is, you have, you have stores. And you can sell a lot of things there. And for sure, the, 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 the most important banking products will be selling uh, by the mobile device. Uh, as soon as the, all the banks put the, in, uh, available their products in the, in, the, in the mobile device. Because, you know, you, you, you wake up and say, I want a car, I want a, a house, I want uh, uh, furniture. But you don't wake up and say, I want to have an insurance, a life insurance. <laughs> then the insurance, the insurance, it's the next step for the, for the, for the branch, branches networks. Because it's a very pushy product. All the insurance are very pushy. I, I'm not talking about 
the the new generation of of uh, of insurance because that kind of insurance you will take it in the mobile device but the traditional insurance that is the the core business for the for the insurance company uh, i think that is the future the branches will be uh, evolved to a, a little agencies of uh, of insurance so, that's reasonable and more advisory than than transactional uh, places uh, so, yeah, so Jose, are you thinking of opening branches as a fintech? Uh -huh, good Not question. really, but uh, but what I would uh, say is that uh, the observation that we are seeing lots of branches. The question is, which are the customers that are still going to the branches? Yeah, exactly. And so, so you need to to your eyeball experiment. You should do a hedonic approach to your eyeball experiment and see which are those customers and i can assure you that they are getting older and they are uh, and they are not probably your your top clients that let, let me still, uh, I, i disagree with that 50 of the population receive their income in cash It, they are young also they are 20 year old guys that are going to the branch to deposit if they have an account And in many cases, they don't do so because they don't have the, in the incentive to do so. It's costly for them to do that. Then the, the people that is going to the branch is not old. They are also very young people there. So I invite you to qualify it a bit the question yeah. that is way. Uh, yeah. uh, I, there, 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 I'm not saying that there are no young... Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I want to say about something. what you guys said. So Bill Gates said that uh, people don't need the banks any banking. It was partially right uh, and very wrong because people might still need bankers, maybe not the branches, but bankers. And why this is so? As uh, uh, Hugo mentioned, mobile technology is a technology of the demand. I call it a pool technology. People typically go here to get something specific, while uh, most of the banking revenues that matter going forward in a world that is commoditized and low interest rates operate in a push economy. Is the investment products, uh, is the insurance products. If you look at the UK, car insurance is compulsory, but almost 50% of people still buy it from a broker. They don't do it online, which would be very easy because there are biological distances between people and financial services in using digital compared to where they do the e-commerce. So now the point is that how do you qualify those relationships? Because you still have to digitize those relationships. And there is a secret sauce basically to understand these elements so that you announce the capability of bankers to service most clients for a lower price using artificial intelligence so that they start bridging the gap until one day AI will become so deeply, truly conversational that mobile will turn from being a pull technology into push economy. That is not happening next year. Okay. Uh, I one, will leave you with one more totally comment, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, just very quick. You wanted to mention no, something? No, no. Very quickly. Um, branches are not going to disappear, but banks that rely on branches for revenue, they will disappear. I'll leave you with that thought. Okay. Um, Another question, uh, if I wanted to get updated on the issues that were discussed in this panel and I were to buy a printed book on Amazon, probably most of what appeared on that book would be obsolete because of the way these things move so fast. Uh, we are in an education event, precisely organized so that professionals in the industry can get up-to-date knowledge, breakthrough knowledge to the minute not to one year ago, two years ago, that a book is printed. How important are these spaces? How important are these events organized by Rismatics to get the financial community updated on these trends that seem sometimes to surpass us? Paolo, you want to have... Oh, okay. It's very, very interesting. I think that to, to have the same the same space to, to, to have this conversation with competitors, with ex experts, consult, consulting guys. I think that it's, it's a beautiful thing because, you know, the future, uh, we build the future as we are talking about it. It's true. So, For me, it's, it's mar mar wonderful.
I've been on risk matrix for multiple years with our common friend, John Hall on quantitative finance. And when I launched my first book at the Fields Institute of Mathematical Sciences and Research in Toronto, I remember that John made this statement. He said that to his students studying risk management, you will not be risk managers in the future, you will be data scientists. And that was 2015. So then talking to Alain Barouche, we said, need to change also the format. So Rismatix is growing and it's turning into a digital transformation event because that is important because these professions are changing. You still need a lot of competencies. You still need a deep understanding of banking, but also a deep understanding of technology. So it's good that we all are here today talking together because it's the only way to share and to move forward to make sure that it really happens in the proper way. And we're going to turn Paolo into an NFT. <laughs> Let me okay. add to what Paolo uh -huh. and Hugo were saying, and I, and I think that in, uh, in this uh, current century, it's going to be about understanding much better the customers. And that means that uh, everybody needs to be constantly learning, and as Hugo was saying, learning from uh, your peers, uh, colleagues, competitors, and risk medics always has uh, brought top talent for people to uh, to get in that constant education uh, path. Great. Well, thank you all for just a great conversation, a great panel. It has been exciting having you all at the Digital Banking and Financial Technologies Forum by Rismatics. We are looking forward to seeing you again here with us. <laughs>